you bring its essence to life in 2003 by bringing in Eve Ensler's vagina monologues to India. Controversial global cultural phenomenon celebrates its 200th year. Join the V-Day movement to end violence against women once and for all. Women and men ending violence all together. Do join us for the performance at 7.30 p.m. In 2003 March, on March 8th, um, we opened the show at Prithvi Theatre on International Women's Day. There's one piece on pubic hair. She says, you know, even after I started uh, shaving my pubic hair, he never stopped screwing around. And in, our, in the case of our play, I'm even bold enough to say that I think it saved a few lives. Welcome to Gagri of Tales. I'm so happy to have the privilege to speak to the mother and son duo who have transformed India's conversation on gender violence and rights. Bharat Muni's Natishastra, the oldest surviving text on Indian performing arts, calls theater as the fifth way to transform the masses. And you bring its essence to life in 2003 by bringing in Eve Ensler's vagina monologues to India, which has also been called the most important piece of political theater of the last decade. So today I would love if you could tell our viewers briefly about the Vagina Monologues and the V-Day. Yeah. Uh, well, the Vagina Monologues is a play written by E. Bensler, who now only need, wishes to be known by the letter V. And uh, she wrote this play after interviewing over 200 women from all over the world, including Bosnia and Kosovo, which were major issues when this particular play was written. But these are stories of women all through the world, all over the world, you know. I mean, women are being baptized in our own country. The end, it, there seems to be no end to abuse of women or uh, children, girl children especially. And uh, this play is therefore of very uh, vital importance to somebody over here. You know, 97, I was still in my late, mid to late 20s. And I enjoyed the play. But I don't think I, one as a male, and secondly, as someone who was still relatively young, I don't think I fully got what the play was about. But I do remember sitting in that audience of about maybe six, seven hundred people. And I felt for that 90 minutes of the play that I was in a cricket match with the audience reaction in terms of the hooting and the shouting at the stage and the laughing and the clapping mid-sentence and the, the cheers and the, and it literally was like being at a sporting event. That audience had taken to that place so deeply and it was largely a female audience. Mm. Um, and so I came out of the theater one, I mean, I enjoyed the play. I was moved in many parts, but I didn't get it entirely, but mm. I was very, by the audience reaction. I'd never seen a piece of theater do that uh, the way I saw it that, that day. And then in uh, roughly about 98, my mother was visiting Atlanta where my sister and her family live. And uh, I was there at the same time. It was around this, this time, December. And uh, there was another touring company of Vagina Monologues that was happened to be in Atlanta. And so I told my mom, I said, you know, I said, uh, you've not seen this. I said, here's a ticket. I've already seen the play, mm -hmm. but go enjoy it. I'll pick you up when you're done. And I dropped her off at the theater, went, you know, to a bookstore and whatever, came back. And before she even got in the car, she leans in through the open door and she says, we have to take this to India. Uh, the VDA movement, of course, was a movement that was brought about to make, to bring about an awareness of this abuse and, uh, and gender discrimination, etc., through raising funds and through bring and the funds bring about an awareness towards uh, towards ending this uh, particular uh, this particular tragedy that is really falling upon all women all over the world. You know, according to a, a WHO research, it was shown that one out of every three women in this world will be abused at one time or the other. Unfortunately, in India, it is one out of every two. And therefore, the importance of a play like this cannot be emphasized enough. 
Iraq was very, very protective and wanted to make sure that uh, who she thought were the right people got the rights. We didn't know her at all. And apparently several, several other people had applied for the rights to the play before us. Oh. Yeah, I didn't met her in New York. And uh, I think that meeting convinced her that she should give the rights to us. And she told us at that meeting, I remember very clearly, she said, you know, she said, the reason I'm selecting you over all the other people who've applied is because you're the only people who applied uh, who didn't ask to cut this and change that and, you know, uh, alter the play to suit the Indian sensibilities. And uh, I remember Eve was so, again, impressed not only with the adaptation that Mabano had done, but also with how the audience really connected with that piece, because it was Indian in its flavor. We've not changed the text, we've changed the context um, of, the, of the pieces. And uh, it's been very rewarding because I think it's really allowed the audience to connect better because it's in their um, frame of experience and language. And even more successful in that sense, is the Hindi um, version of the play. Attention is that we don't talk about our own unique 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 पहली बात तो उसे ढूंढना ही इतना मुश्किल है कि कई औरतें तो कई दिन महीने साल बल्कि अपनी पूरी उम्र गुजार देती हैं वहां देखे बगैर ऐसी ही एक औरत से जब मैं मिली तो उसने कहा कि उसके पास टाइम नहीं and yet people who understand Hindi and understand English mm. say that the Hindi one has far more energy because it resonates. It resonates with uh, the Indian audiences. But in the Bastis, it was a whole different, uh, you so know. What was their they, response? What was their response like? The, the Bastis were a totally different experience. They got every nuance because they went through everything that we were talking about. And it was very amazing that Many of them shared their personal stories with us after the show was over and had it video recorded. And it was very, I don't know, it somehow touched me tremendously, you know. And they were not at all inhibited in talking about what they were undergoing. Not at all. And I hope someday some multinational gives us some money where we can put these videos together and make a little film out of it. It is a reflection of personal experiences. Yes. Uh, so what, to what extent does it take a political stand? So it has a political uh, bent to it, but it also is a very brutal, very explicit play. You know, it talks about every kind of abuse to women, mm -hmm. physical, mental, emotional. It's not just rape, but you know, sometimes horrible things are done to women. Like there is one piece on pubic hair, you know, where the husband insists on having his wife remove her pubic hair and she doesn't want to do that and so they go to a counselor and uh, he says that uh, he doesn't want to have sex with her because she doesn't clean herself there and so ultimately she gives in you know compromise is the one word that is always used to women you know adapt and compromise it is never the other gender that compromises and she says at the end and it's a little funny it's sad she says you know even after i stopped uh, even after i started uh, shaving my pubic hair. He never stopped screwing around. So there are very many, there are pieces, there's a piece, a very, very beautiful piece on a little girl who was abused by her uncle. And how he, from the, from the young age of three and four, when she used to play with boys, how she was also always harassed, hit over there until this one uncle abused her when she was 10. And then uh, somehow she gets over the mental trauma, but not really enough to make her want to have sex. And then she meets a woman who teaches her how to enjoy sex. Because really, sex is one of the most beautiful things. I mean, whether people like me mm -hmm. to saying that or not, 
it suggests that you have to explain to your child that it comes with a lot of responsibility. But we don't do that. And then we crib about, you know, boys not respecting girls, boys not being aware of being sensitive towards girls. And I think it is somewhere where we have failed. Could you tell me an incident of how these funds gathered from the play were further used to empower girls? Once that really stands out in my memory uh, is that in, uh, again, this must have been about 2006 or seven. Um, I think Savvy Magazine, if I'm not mistaken, had featured this uh, young acid attack victim named Hasina Hussain. Mm -hmm. And Hasina was a young, uh, bright Muslim girl from uh, uh, Bangalore. And uh, her parents had been convincing her to get married. And she said, I don't want marriage. I first want to get a job. I want to become economically uh, independent. And so she got a job. Unfortunately, her boss at work started making advances towards her. And again, she gently kind of uh, turned him down, I suppose, is the way to put it. And he one day showed up at her house and threw acid in her face. And she was completely blinded in both eyes. Her entire nasal passages melted because of the acid attack. She had to have over about 39 operations just to reconstruct the bones and the, so she could breathe. Uh, her eyesight was never going to come back. I brought her to Mumbai actually a little nervous because we were doing a big fundraiser for her and it was uh, the fundraiser when people like Farhan Akhtar and Zoya Akhtar and Imran Khan, the actor, um, and Lovely Tandon from Slumdog Millionaire and uh, Sandeep Soparkar and all these people got together and we put on an, a great evening of entertainment uh, and raised funds for her. And at the end uh, of that evening, um, we asked Hasina to just address the audience because I think audiences always want to know that their money is going to somewhere real, you know. And uh, I, I remember I was in the lighting booth, uh, controlling the lights with my tech team and all. And Hasina came on stage and she spoke for about, we had told us Hasina talked for two, three minutes. I think she spoke for about maybe 10, 11 minutes. And when she got off stage, she said, you know, she said, this is the first time I've spoken like this since my accident. So she said, that's why I could stop. I am moral support देने की कोशिश करती हूँ क्योंकि acid attack survivors इतनी depression में होती हैं और उनकी disability को accept करना बहुत बड़ी बात होती है. So this is just one story about one individual helped by so many who has in turn now turned it around to help other individuals, you know, and 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 that kind of community and that kind of experience um, is um, I still you know, get goosebumps thinking about these things. How different do you think has the response been in various cities in India? The books that we have collected over 18 years, there's been only one negative comment by a man from Hyderabad who said, this is all bullshit. But that's okay, we are used to everything, you know, 12, 18 years, we are used to everything, good, bad, ugly. But luckily for us, we are very blessed. There's never been really an ugly incident, never. In fact, very positive life changes amongst the audiences have taken place. You want me to tell you one or two? Yes. Please. Going to Delhi uh, in the plane with, to perform with my cast and crew. And I was about to sit down when a girl from across the aisle told me, she said, ma'am, can I come and give you a hug? So she got up and I said, yes, you can give me a hug. But I mean, I, I'd like to know why, you know, some random person in the middle of a packed plane getting up and saying this loudly, and she said, oh, she took out her mobile phone and she showed me a picture of me and a man standing next to me. And she said, this was the happiest moment of our life. And I was thrilled because there is a tagline for the vagina monologues that says, if you want to find a good man, you must go to the vagina monologues. And so I said, I'm so happy for you that you found happiness. And she said, no, ma'am, not at all. She said, after viewing your play, I walked out of a three and a half year abusive marriage. So I'd come to view the play with my husband. I made him stand next to you to commemorate that moment when I decided enough is enough. And I said, I don't know. Yeah, it sort of made you know, my hair stand on its end. I mean, it, it, it was unbelievable.
and there have been many, many things like this, like a woman fainted in the audience, a, a young woman. The piece that was going on was where the uncle abuses that girl, a uh, 10 year old girl. So this girl fainted and fell to the floor and she was sobbing. So I thought maybe there was, you know, she was feeling giddy and her pressure had fallen. So we moved her to the uh, green room and we made her rest there. We continued with the play. And later on, when we went back to the green room, she told us that this had brought a closure to a trauma that she had suffered because her sister, who was 10 years old, was being abused by the uncle. And this girl had walked in on that scene. And her parents said nothing to the uncle because, you know, parents always feel that the victim is to be shamed and not the perpetrator of the crime, which is one of the biggest, you know, mistakes that Indians make. And she said somehow just watching it made me feel like, okay, so it's happening to people. It happened to my sister. It brought a closure to me. And six months after this day, we were in Delhi performing. And the sister who, was, who had been raped came backstage and said, do you know, the girl who fainted was my sister. So these oh. are yeah, strange things, strange things have happened. They left their dirty sperm inside me. It became a river of poison and pus. And all the crops died. And the fish. My vagina, a live, wet water village. They butchered it, invaded it, and burnt it down. I do not touch now. I do not visit. I live someplace else now. I don't know where that is. What has your personal experience been like of stepping into characters with such traumatic experiences? I do a Parsi piece, you yes. know, where this, where this young girl goes on a date with a young man at 15 and when he tries to kiss her, she uh, sort of becomes wet and mm -hmm. he calls her a stinky weird Vasmarti Chokri. And so, I mean, I know, and after that, she never goes out with men. She never has had an orgasm, you know, and it's so sad. She said, my life has, was finished. I just couldn't bring myself to go out with men for the shame that that particular incident had uh, sort of imposed upon me. And I know lots of women, Parsi women, who are single, who never go out. Possibly there is something within their psyche which, you know, triggers off this feeling of shame or feeling of holding back. And so you put that into it, you know. Uttar Pradesh has had more multiple reported cases even in the lockdown. And uh, being a young girl from this state, I want women to retain that spark within them and people not to get desensitized to what's happening around them and to normalize them. So what would that one message be to these experiences that you would give us? The one message I give is to the parents first that educate, educate, and educate your daughters. For God's sake, do that. Because until you do that, the girls have no chance of surviving in a world that has so many sick men around. The men that while women have been fighting this and have to fight it, that victory over that will not be won till the men get their act together. And that act together is to, of course, first stop the violence if you are perpetrating it in whatever form it is. And it's not just beating women, but it, if you are a filmmaker, and you're spreading misogynistic images through your cinema, stop that immediately, even though it may be making you lots of money. If you're making a fairness scream, stop that, because you're spreading uh, messages largely to women about their inferiority. You know, So I would say to men uh, that we've got to join that fight. We've got to join um, that uh, movement, because without us doing it, uh, it's going to continue to get worse the men that while women have been fighting this and have to fight it that victory over that will not be won till the men get their act together and that act together is to of course first stop the violence if you are perpetrating it in whatever form it is and it's not just beating women but it, if you are a filmmaker and you're spreading misogynistic images through your cinema stop that immediately even though it may be making you lots of money if you're making a fairness scream stop that because you're spreading uh, messages largely to women about their inferiority, you know, so I would say to men 
uh, that we've got to join that fight. We've got to join um, that uh, movement because without us doing it, uh, it's going to continue to get worse. And for the girls and the children, young people, men and uh, girls and boys, I say, ask questions. Question your parents, question your teachers, question your religion. Because it seems everybody is totally fucked up. And unless they give you answers that don't suit, that don't make sense to you, don't accept those answers. You must, and you must accept your children from questioning you. And you must accept that this world is different from the one you were brought up in. You have to accept them and you have to let them lead a life that is right for them. Just making them sexually repressed is... You see, the main reason why rape, etc. is so uh, so rampant in UP mm. and everywhere, not just UP, is because people are very repressed. We never talk about sex. You know, India sells everything from jarus to saris to cars through sex. But mm. we never sit down with our children and have a same discussion about what sex is all about. We just don't do that. Even when we talk about their private parts, we say choo-choo, pee-pee. I mean, my grandsons in America, when they were three and two, mm. would use the word penis or vagina. They would not say choo-choo, pee-pee. They would not. They, because they were not taught those words. And those words somehow, I think, inculcate a sense of shame as far as those parts of our bodies are concerned. They're just the biological names of a part of the body of over half this world's population. So this is my message. Thank Thank you for coming on Gagri of Tales and talking to us about a play which has been a beacon of hope and change for many. Thank you, Zina. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Thank you so much.